My name is Brenda, and welcome to Horrifying History, where you will hear about the unexplained, paranormal, and supernatural happenings that has stained the pages of history. In episode 10, we discuss famous hauntings in two separate plantations. Lore developed around these plantations for several reasons. One of these was to help bring in tourists, but the other one is that historically, lures that surround plantations in many times is altered to emphasize the horrors of slavery. In the story you're going to hear today, neither of these apply. The case you're about to hear actually happened the way it's presented. There was no exaggerations to bring in tourists, but it actually is a case of extreme hatred that targeted one family, its corruption at its highest levels, and it's about a community that developed the taste for blood. Welcome to Minnesota number 10, The Black Donleys. James and Joanna Donnelly married in Ireland in 1840 and then immigrated to Canada with their son, James Jr. The Donnellys hoped to establish a homestead for themselves and with their seven other children that was born in Canada in the townships of Bidolph near London, Ontario. Like many communities in Ontario during the 19th century, this community dealt with constant crime ranging from robbery to assault and murder. Bringing anyone to justice wasn't easy since the majority of the constables were untrained and most often were actually the criminals themselves. Also, for various reasons, courts at the time were just not handing out what people thought were reasonable punishments. After moving to this area, the Donnellys decided to settle on a piece of land that did not belong to James legally and became squatters. The land was owned by the Canada Company, and they leased it to a man named James Grace. It's unknown if James knew that the land was occupied by anyone, and squatting at the time was a common frontier practice supported by the courts under common law property rights. In 1856, a man named Patrick Farrell bought the land that James Donnelly was squatting on and was very surprised to discover the Donnellys living on the land when he arrived from Ireland to take possession. The matter went before the courts in 1857, with Farrell attempting to evict the Donnellys. The disputants eventually agreed to allow James Donnelly to keep and reside on 50 acres of land, which was much, much less than what Donnelly actually cleared over the 10 years he occupied the land. Even though there was an agreement made in court, Farrell would vocally attack the Donnellys every time he saw them in public. On June 27, 1857, Farrell attacked Donnelly at a public event with a handspike, and then he died when Donnelly threw another hand spike at him in self-defense. James Donnelly then hid for the next two years before turning himself in for trial. James was sentenced to be hanged in 1859, but his wife Joanna submitted a petition for clemency. James had his sentence reduced to seven years in Kingston Penitentiary in Kingston, Ontario. In 1873, the Donnelly Stagecoach Line was started by William Donnelly, who was James's son, and was hugely successful. William managed the company with his brothers Michael, John, and Thomas, and the company rivaled the official Stagecoach Line that was in place since 1838. The competition soon fell to pressure and sold their company to Patrick Flanagan, who became determined to drive the Donleys out of business. 
This set the stage for a feud between Donnelly Stagecoach and Flanagan and Crawley Stage, where property was smashed or burned, horses were beaten or killed, and stables were burnt to the ground. The community blamed the violence on the Donnellys, which further worsened their reputation. As tensions built towards the family, they were charged with many things, including assault, arson, trespassing, verbal assault, attempted murder, theft, robbery, and assaulting a police officer. But the Donnellys were found not guilty in a court of law, which added to the community's hatred against the family. In June of 1879, Father John Conley created a peace society in the county after preaching to his parish about the activities occurring and his thoughts on who was responsible. He asked for everyone to pledge support by having their home searched for stolen property. Out of this, the Vigilance Committee formed, and evidence shows that the members of both entities were actually the ones responsible for the crimes in the area. The Donnellys chose not to sign the pledge, since they feared that the community would use this as an opportunity to hide stolen property on their land and set them up. To make matters even worse... James Donnelly apparently stood up in a church service to denounce this priest, who began to preach hatred against Protestants during his services, due to many of the Donnelly's friends were of that religion. He also donated money to build a building for the Anglican Church, and this outraged the society. This anger completely boiled over on February 3rd, 1880, which was the date that the Peace Society decided to take action. You see, their original plan was to visit the Donnelly family home late at night, handcuff the male members of the household, and then drag them outside, hang them from a tree by the neck until they confessed to all the crimes with the intent only to hurt the Donnellys. Yeah. Anyways, the Peace Society then set up a surveillance of the property to try to determine who would be home and when, and how to enter the property without being detected. On the day of the murders, James and his son went to town to pick up a little boy named Johnny Connor, who was a relative and was going to look after the farm the following day when the family went to court for the latest round of charges. At about 1 a.m., the Peace Society got together to start drinking to gain the courage they needed before they mounted their attack. When they felt empowered enough by the liquor, they walked to the Donnelly home and surrounded the perimeter of the property. Constable James Carroll then entered the unlocked home and handcuffed the sleeping Tom Donnelly. After the handcuffing, Constable Carroll woke Tom, telling him he was under arrest, which woke up his mother Joanna and her niece Bridget, who was visiting from Ireland. The commotion also woke John Donnelly, who asked the constable what the charges were. Tom then asked the constable to read the arrest warrant, and since there was none, the constable then let out a signal for the men to storm the house with their clubs. At this point, the vigilante started beating John, Joanna, and Tom, but Bridget was able to escape. She ran upstairs to hide. Johnny also hid underneath John Donnelly's bed. Since the men didn't know he was on the property, they didn't go looking for him. John Donnelly was hit repeatedly in the skull, causing brain damage. Joanna, she fought hard against her attackers, but was eventually beaten down by Constable Carroll. Tom was able to break free from his attackers and started running towards the front door, but as he did, he was stabbed multiple times with a pitchfork. When Tom became limp on the ground, Several more of the men carried his body into the kitchen, where his parents were, and they removed his handcuffs. But they decided to hit Tom in the head just a couple more times for good measure. The men then moved upstairs where they found poor Bridget hiding and beat her to death. They carried her body downstairs and put her with the rest of the family. While this was all happening, one of the men decided to decapitate the family dog when the dog wouldn't stop barking. 
Now this is when the group realized that they were missing John Jr. and on the fly decided to create another plan to rid the community of the Donnelly family. They lit the house on fire with the bodies inside and went hunting for John. After they left, Johnny was able to escape the burning home and went searching for help. At approximately 2 a.m., the Peace Society arrived at Wayland's Corners, where John lived, and they surrounded the house. This time, they decided to attempt to get Will Donnelly, who also lived at that location, to come out. Instead of storming the home, they started beating Will's prized horse to lure him out of the house. The problem was, the barn was just too far away from the house from anyone to hear anything. Spoiler alert, the horse survived. One of the men started calling for Will while carrying a shotgun to the side door of the house. Will awoke, hearing someone calling him, but it was John that opened the door. He received gunshots to his chest and groin, which caused damage to his chest, lung, collarbone, and ribs. John fell to the ground where he was shot seven more times for punishment for his supposed actions against the community. Will Donnelly's wife, Nora, heard the commotion and tried to drag John to safety, but she couldn't move the body. Will hid in a bedroom, but was able to look out the window to see who was attacking his home. And one of these men was Nora's own brother. It was at this point the Peace Society decided they were just too worn out from all these murders and decided to just survey the perimeter until somebody decided to come outside. Three hours later, after seeing no one was coming out, they decided to leave the property. The very next day, Johnny, Will, and his wife reported the actions to the local magistrate, and Constable Carroll, along with five other men, were arrested, even though it was reported that 35 men participated. At the trial, one of the key witnesses was Johnny O'Connor, who witnessed the massacre. The vigilantes did everything they possibly could to prevent him from testifying, including burning down his parents' house and threatening the family. William Donnelly also testified, and he suffered retaliation. The defense witnesses were friends and family of the vigilante community, and they backed each alibi of every person on trial. Due to this, the first trial was a hung jury, with one juror declaring he wouldn't convict any of them, even if he witnessed the murders himself. During the second trial, the judge gave instructions to the jury that Johnny's testimony wasn't to be heard due to he believed it was unreliable after he said Johnny's mother attempted to be paid for his testimony. Constable Carroll and the five men were determined to be not guilty, and when this was announced, the community decided to hold a party that was for a full day and night. Today, the Donleys are a well-known piece of Canadian folklore. However, the inhabitants of this township has tried to suppress the subject for many years due to the residents have had ancestors directly linked to the murders. In the more recent years, though, several businesses have started up centered on the tragedy and songs and books have been released about the subject. In 2007, NBC released a TV series called The Black Donnellys, and in 2017, a short film was also released about the events. You can also take a tour of the Donnelly homestead, to which many people have reported supernatural events taking place. Some of these include 
The road where the vigilantes walk down is supposedly haunted, and horses will not go down this road on the night of February 3rd and in the early morning of February 4th. If they do, they supposedly die soon afterwards. It's also said that horses will not pass on the Donnelly property at all. And lastly, people report headless horses galloping throughout the township, and live horses throughout the township go berserk on a regular basis. At the Donnelly homestead, it is said that items go missing and are later found in unexplainable places. Doors slam by themselves, and people have the regular feeling of being watched from the barn. People hear footsteps in the home and experience the feeling of being touched. Individuals also hear screams coming from the barn and voices in the middle of the night. There have been reports of seeing shadows of people and ghostly figures throughout the property. The family who purchased the property decided to call in a local priest to bless the property and give the Donnelly family their last rites. But sadly, the ghostly activities continue to this day. Thank you for joining me today for our mini-sode of Horrifying History. Be sure to visit us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to learn more, access show notes, and discover bonus content. Please subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss future episodes, and leave us a review since all feedback helps improve our show. If you have ideas for future episodes, have any questions, or just want to say hi, feel free to send me an email at horrifyinghistory at outlook.com. Thank you for listening today, and until next time.